for joining us for tonight's webinar, Feeding Our Feathered Friends. I love talking about uh, feeding birds. I think it's such a wonderful way to bring the birds right to your classroom and spark excitement about nature and science. So just before we get in too deep, I want to make sure that everyone here is familiar with Zoom. I'm sure these days we might be feeling a little zoomed out, but just in case you have not used this platform before, when I shared with my screen, it probably went full screen for you. So I'm going to recommend that you exit full screen and this will allow you to dock the chat window on the side of your screen so you have a better chance of seeing the conversation that's happening there. So the next thing you'll want to do is find the little speech bubble icon. Click on that and then over here, once your chat window pops up, please make sure you select to all panelists and attendees. This will make sure that you can see what each other are saying and you're not just talking to me and Susan. Awesome. All right, let's go ahead and test out that chat window. If you could let us know where you're from and what type of educator you are, that would be awesome. Nice. Welcome, Steve, from BOCES in Westchester. Michelle in Ohio, pre-K through grade five. Nice. District Garden Coordinator from Washington. Awesome. Third grade teacher from California. Oregon Elementary School, Washington K-5, awesome. Third grade from Carthage, New York, awesome. Great to have such a nice group here tonight. We're going to talk a lot about um, different ways that we can engage students around birds, science, and nature. And that has a lot to do with our mission here at the lab. So the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's mission is to interpret and conserve the Earth's biological diversity through research, education, and citizen science focused on birds. And K-12 education is one of the really important ways that we can all help get the next generation excited about conserving the Earth. And our mission at the K-12 team is to create innovative resources and trainings that build science skills while inspiring young people to connect to local habitats, explore biodiversity and engage in citizen science projects. My name is Kelly Schaefer and I'm our outreach coordinator here. And I'm joined tonight by Susan Licker who is our education specialist. And she will be taking care of you in the chat window, um, answering questions and sharing links so feel free to ask questions in in the chat or um, I'll even be asking for some feedback and please feel free to put that in the chat. One quick note that we do try to use the chat over the Q&A section. It's just a little bit easier for us to manage. So if you could focus your comments there, that would be awesome. So essentially what I get to do with the K-12 education team is create resources and trainings that package all of the amazing work that the lab does and make that available to educators so that you can share that with the kids that you work with. We do that in two main ways. We have curricular resources, so anything from one-off activities to activity booklets to full-on curricula. We also do a lot of educator training, both in person and online. And uh, recently, within the last six months or so, we've also branched out to some virtual experiences for youth. 
And we have a little bit of an ambitious gen agenda for tonight. I want us to go over some bird feeding basics. I also want to share with you resources from the lab to inspire learning by birds, or excuse me, with birds, and to introduce you to several citizen science projects that can complement bird feeding. So let's start out with the very basic basics of feeding birds. And I'm curious, I wanna throw this out to you. Feel free to share your answers in the chat window. Why feed birds? Why is that, that something, why is that something people are excited about? And also why is that something that would be a good educational tool? Because they're fun to watch. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, you have the opportunity to observe wild animals up close. Oh, it can be a community project. Absolutely, Tricia. <laughs> Michelle, selfish reasons. I want to bring the birds to me. Well, I don't think that's selfish, you know. Um, I think that actually solves a bit of a problem for some educators. So yeah, that's a great benefit of feeding birds. Oh, Kim's also suggesting that you can bring birds into your garden or your area and they'll eat some bugs for you while they're there. Yeah. They're very interesting to see. Quick reminder to change your settings in the chat window to make sure that you are sending to all panelists and attendees, just so everybody can see your great ideas. Steve's saying that you can get to know the species around you and see how they change with the seasons. Yeah, that's awesome. And Jane's saying it's a great way to instill an appreciation and awareness of nature. You guys have hit on all of the reasons why I really love um, feeding birds. And another wonderful thing about feeding birds is if you are from the northern part of the country, this might be a familiar sight to you. Granted, these birds in this particular picture are European birds, but this is a familiar sight in many Norman, northern climates. Snow, snow, snow. And it, so feeding birds helps birds too. So research has shown us that birds use bird feeding stations as supplementary food sources. So when the going gets rough, they have a place to go to help them get through. So it's a nice benefit for our feathered friends as well. And as we talked about just a moment ago, it brings the birds to you. So as an educator, sometimes it can be challenging to think about tackling birds because you're like, well, I don't have binoculars and I don't have the equipment to do it. But if you can hang a bird feeder and you can get your hands on some seed, you might be able to bring the birds close enough to you that you don't really need binoculars to enjoy observing them and to do uh, science while watching birds. Oh, <laughs> I, uh, outside my window, I can just hear the barred owls calling. I think they approve. Another really wonderful aspect of feeding birds is that it opens the door to scientific study, including participation in citizen science projects. And this combination of citizen science, which we'll go into the definition of that in a little bit, and feeding birds provides exciting real world opportunities to study wild animals while doing real science, so authentic science. It can be a relatively low cost activity. You can do it year round and it helps birds while sparking the curiosity of your students. So it is um, many, many faceted, wonderful pastime to feed birds. Now, often when I start talking about all these birds that you're gonna see and you're gonna be able to do all these projects, I'll have some teachers who will say, this all sounds wonderful, but I just don't think there are enough birds around me. And it's easy to 
think that and feel that way when we don't always look for birds. I know that for myself, before I started really watching birds, I had these bird blinders on. So I just wasn't thinking about them, right? Because I had other things on my mind and I wasn't quite tuned into that world. But once you start looking for birds, you will see that they are absolutely everywhere. And wherever your setting are, I'm sure there are birds in the area. Um, in, in cities, there are some common birds that will come to feeders like house finches and house sparrows and starlings. So you might want to just put one out and see what happens. You might be surprised. When it comes to feeding birds, there are a lot of different approaches that you can take and there are a lot of different feeders out there. So you might see feeders like this one in the upper left hand corner, which is a tube feeder and it has the little perches on the sides. Um, this is great for things like finches and chickadees and sparrows. They often like this sort of feeder. You can get larger birds on this as well. Um, you might find other feeders like hummingbird feeders or the suet feeder over here that is a, a favorite of woodpeckers and nuthatches. Um, woodpeckers love suet, nice high in fat and calories for them. And then this hopper feeder over here, which is going to favor larger birds like um, blue jays and morning doves cardinals, things like that. Uh, and then you can even do something as simple as a platform feeder where we see this blue jay. So there are all sorts of different feeders out there and they use all sorts of different foods. We mentioned the suet, which is that kind of rendered fat with seeds and sometimes even bugs in it. Regular seed blends. Um, you can even do whole shelled peanuts for things like crows and jays. If you live in a part of the country that gets hummingbirds, putting out a hummingbird feeder can be a lot of fun. Uh, hummingbirds can be surprising if you haven't had the opportunity to watch them much uh, and kids will find this super fun. They tend to be kind of like aggressive. There's a lot of spunk in that little bird body and they can be super fun to watch. And if you're curious about how to choose the right sort of seed for where you are and the type of birds you want to attract, we do have some resources that can help you. So Project Feeder Watch is a citizen science project, which we'll discuss in a little while, but they have a really awesome common feeder bird interactive. And I believe Susan's going to share the link for that in the chat window. And you can use this interactive to check out different sorts of seeds and what type of birds they attract. So this chart is from that and you can see a number of different types of seed and the birds that they attract. So if we look at this top row here, we'll see that sunflower seeds like black oil sunflower attracts a really wide variety of birds. So if you wanted, if you could only put out one seed and you wanted to get the most variety ever, that would be a great choice. But if you are particularly interested in finches and sparrows, you might pick out a seed blend that had a lot of millet um, since that attracts both of those. So you can make some choices based on the sort of birds that you wanna see and the food that you have available. So this is more about this common feeder bird interactive. This is gonna help you kind of make these preferences and these choices more clear. Um, it's really wonderful because you can break things down by region. So you can select your region of the country. You can select what type of food you're interested in and even the type of feeder that you wanna put out there. So here I have a snapshot of all regions of Canada and the US and the food type of Milo for the top one and the food type of black oil sunflower for the bottom. And you can see the difference in the number of birds these two types of seeds attract and even a difference in some of the variety that they attract. Um, something to watch out for is in our part of the country in Eastern US, there are somewhat fewer birds that really are attracted to things like milo and millet. There's a few more in on the west coast. Um, so if you get a seed blend that's really heavy in milo and millet, you might find that a lot of it doesn't get eaten. So you might want to adjust 
the sort of seeds that you're putting out there so you're getting the most bang for your buck. And you can also go with classic feeders that you make. So this can be a really fun way to get your kids excited and participating in bird feeding by helping them and encouraging them to build their own feeders. So we have a classic soda bottle feeder here, as well as the classic pine cone feeder. So pine cone, I, I probably would venture to guess that most of us have made one of these in our lifetime. Very simple, roll in peanut butter, roll in seeds. If you're worried about nut allergies, Crisco works as well. You might just find that you need to like get it, warm it up just a little bit to make it softer. But these are great options. We have a blog on our website that will provide you with some ideas for how to make your own seed cakes and feeders. Um, Susan's gonna share the link to that in the chat window. And we also are really lucky to be able to provide Pennington window bird feeders to educators. So if you, can use one of these for your classroom. I'll try and remember to share the link with you at the end. Susan, I don't know if you can go in our store and find this link and share it now, but you can order a window bird feeder for your classroom. You'll just need to pay $6 to cover shipping. There's a little bit of a snafu in the store right now where if your billing address and your shipping address are different, you're probably going to need to email me your correct shipping address and you'll get an order confirmation and you can just reply to that. Um, but yes, you can get this window bird feeder and these are great ways to bring the birds right to you for close observation. They hold about a pound of bird seed and they'll hold any of your normal mixes, including like black oil sunflower. Um, we're very fortunate to have a sponsor in Pennington who's provided these for us. And a lot of people have expressed some concern and I appreciate so much that people are thinking about this um, regarding window collisions when they see these window feeders. So I'm happy to report that having a bird feeder on your window is actually really safe for birds. And there's been some studies looking at this. So if we look at percentage of fatalities after a window strike and we're under a meter, we see that none of these are fatal, which is fantastic. Um, and that has a lot to do with the fact that birds get confused and fly into windows most when they're scared. So um, if a predator comes through and they're startled, they might get disoriented and, and hit a window. But if they are close, within a meter, they don't have enough momentum to hurt themselves. Whereas if they're in the distance of five meters to 10 meters, 15-ish to 30-ish feet, which is where most of us kind of want to place our feeders, that's actually the deadliest collision zone. Um, so putting your feeder close is good for your birds. Now, I will often hear people saying and lamenting the effect that squirrels have on their amount of seed available for birds. Squirrels are, of course, charming and part of our environment, but if you are trying to feed birds, they can be a little bit of a nemesis. Um, so they're pretty notorious for eating you out of house and home with bird feeders but there are some things that you can do to sort of discourage them from becoming an issue. So we recommend putting baffles um, on your poles. If you're hanging bird feeders from like a shepherd's crook or something, you can put a bell baffle like this one over your pole and that just prevents them from being able to climb up. Sometimes you can also put one over top of the feeder so they can't jump down onto it. Feeder, um, squirrels are a little tricky and balancing this, how close to the window is safe versus how far away can squirrels jump can be a challenge because squirrels can jump 10 feet from a good platform. So you gotta kind of, uh, 
you know, make some calculations, cost benefit analysis here and figure out where you can put your feeder that's safe for birds and gonna minimize some squirrel activity. There are also some seeds like safflower seeds, which are not as favored by squirrels, but having done that myself, I can tell you they will develop a taste for it over time. <laughs> and they are clever. So they often will figure out a way around the baffle, but it could actually be like a super fun engineering challenge for your kids to try and engineer a squirrel proof feeder. And if you are concerned about squirrels, there is a bird note that has some advice and I'm gonna ask Susan to share a link to that in the chat window. Um, it's got some tips and tricks for how you might decre decrease squirrel activity around your feeders. Of course, if you choose to embrace the squirrels coming, there's probably some cool like activity between birds and squirrels that you could observe. A couple other things that I'll hear from educators, concerns around other animals being attracted to bird feeders are other rodents like mice and rats um, and bears. So these both can be issues around bird feeders. We suggest raking out the ground beneath the feeder with some regularity to help reduce other rodents. And for bears, it might just be that you cannot feed birds at certain times of year. And if you live in an area that has a lot of bears, you might actually have town and city ordinances that say that you can't feed birds. So that's something you'll wanna check. Now I wanna jump into some resources. You know, the bird feeding basics and maybe you're chomping at the bit to go. And there are some resources that we can provide that will give you some fun activities to do while feeding birds. So the first resource I wanna share with you are our free educator guides. These are around children's trade books. They complement some really wonderful stories um, like Ruby's Birds and Crow Not Crow. Crow Not Crow is a particular favorite. It goes into some bird ID basics and starting just with the very simple method of learning to identify what is a crow and what is not a crow and it's very charming. And we have um, next generation science standard aligned lessons that have art and math and writing all around these books. So this can be a great place to start and they're available for free from our website. Another resource I want to share is Feathered Friends. So when Pennington sponsored us and provided us with these awesome feeders to give out to educators, they also wanted to make sure that there was an education resource to support it. So we wrote Feathered Friends. And it is kind of like a monthly check-in with birds. Um, there are 10 monthly lessons. They're pretty timely, but we have had a lot of people kind of do the lessons as a unit all close together. Other people like to do them as just like a monthly check-in. There are indoor and outdoor components and it covers a lot of really great themes including bird diversity, habitat, flight and migration, conservation, all the way up to citizen science. And this is available as a free download from our website. And once you download this, you'll get um, a follow-up email which will have the link to the feeder we've been discussing as well. So what makes a bird a bird? That is the first lesson that you will find in Feathered Friends. So we're covering some really nice basics here. Um, and what I love about Feathered Friends is it will take you all the way from what makes a bird to bir a bird to participating in citizen science around birds. So it covers a great amount of material and it does it in nice bite-sized ways. And each month it introduces you to a different bird of the month. And there are nice home connections. So there are papers that you can share, copy and share with students or we've had some educators use these in remote learning center, set, excuse me, remote learning settings. There it is, um, to encourage some independent work during the school day. And we cover things like what's in a habitat. We have big ideas, the essential question that these lessons answer, as well as the learning objectives like 
list the four components of the habitat and identify three effects that humans have on the environment. So we even go into human impacts and you'll notice that they are NGSS aligned. And you get to meet new birds every month. So we kind of have this philosophy that um, it can be a little less overwhelming to learn your local birds if you start with just a few birds to focus on. So that's the approach that Feathered Friends takes. Get you familiar with just a few birds at a time. And then it will go all the way to that Be a Citizen Science lesson where it encourages you to participate in the Great Backyard Bird Count. And I'll talk a little bit more about what the GBBC is in a moment. Oops. The last resource that I want to draw your attention to is the Science and Nature Activities for Cooped Up Kids. If you were part of our last webinar in September, you might recognize these resources, but we put out uh, a new one that I want to draw your attention to. So our Cooped Up Kids activities were in created as a response to the pandemic and trying to fill that gap between when some families were all together working from home and before schools were um, providing some lessons. And we've continued to put some of these out with the idea that they are really highly adaptable to remote learning settings as well, and even classrooms. So these are designed with families and educators in mind. They are articulated across the grade bands. We have a K2, 3, 5, and 6, 8 version for each activity. And they are essentially Google slide decks that our third through fifth and sixth through eighth graders can go through rather independently. And they incorporate hands-on activities and outdoor prompts as well. And there's writing and uh, art included too. I wanted to make sure that you were aware that we put out a new activity not so long ago, our ninth activity, which was all on feeding wild birds. And it covers some great material like what do birds eat? How do what birds eat relate to their beaks and the shape of their beaks? And then encourages kids to engineer their own bird feeder. This is possibly one of my favorite activities to do with kids. It's super fun. I've done it with um, my Daisy Troop. So that was Daisy's is kindergarten and first grade. And I was impressed with how good they were at engineering bird feeders even at that age. So I would encourage you if that's something you think would be fun for your kids to go ahead and give it a shot. And we just use like really abundant recyclable materials and also really strange things like I like to throw in some weird things in there because kids are so creative. Um, I threw in an old zebra costume once and you wouldn't believe how many places that striped fabric showed up. All right so once we get these feeders out there we've got some fun lessons but maybe you want to take it to the next step and really dive into some science and i think that's where citizen science can be a really awesome complement to feeding birds so i'm curious to hear from you what are some keywords or definition um, that you or even projects that you think of when you hear of citizen science Feel free to share your response in the chat window. Water quality monitoring, frog watch, iNaturalist, yes. Nature's notebook, eBird, absolutely. These are all wonderful projects. So what are some things that these projects have in common. What makes them citizen science, I wonder? Kathy, I like your definition a lot. Everyday people contributing to science data. Absolutely. I mean, that's kind of the heart of it, right? Citizen science, um, the citizen here referring to a global citizen, 
is when regular folks like you and me who aren't professional scientists go outside, make observations, and share those observations with databases that scientists use to answer real world questions. And when thinking of citizen science, I always love to share this image. I'm wondering if you have any guesses of what you think this image represents. Light pollution, yeah, it absolutely looks like it could be a light pollution map, doesn't it? Ooh, Kathy's guessing migration. We are getting warmer. Getting warmer. It absolutely has to do with birds. Yeah, Steve's got it. Birds being observed and reported. It is eBird data. So eBird is uh, the lab's largest citizen science project and in fact the largest biodiversity related citizen science project in the world. Um, and this map is just fantastic to me because I think it really represents the power of citizen science. Every point of light on this map is a submission to the eBird database. And the fact that we can see so much of the shape of our world is a reflection of how many people care about birds, are observing birds, and sharing those observations with the eBird database. Like you can see shipping lanes out to Hawaii and down to the peninsula of Antarctica. So it's pretty crazy to look at this map and realize that this is all citizen science data. And what that means by the numbers is more than 800 million observations, more than half a million participants in every country of the world and reporting more than 10,500 different species, which is more than 98% of all bird species in the world. So if you think about what it would take a scientist to replicate this data set on their own, it's just not possible. A data set like this is only possible when citizens, when regular folks are participating. It is people powered science. So it's only possible with people everywhere reporting their sightings. And we really do try and view these projects as a partnership between volunteers and professional scientists that allow scientists to answer real world questions that they couldn't possibly answer without this wealth of data. And what's really special about the lab citizen science projects is all of that data that you help collect, you have access to. So if you wanna download sightings from Mozambique, you can do that. Um, that data is your data too. And if birds aren't your thing, which I don't know that why they wouldn't be, but then again, I am absolutely biased. There is a citizen science project out there for you and your kids if they have particular interests. So if your kids are into insects, there's projects out there for you. If they're into plants, there's projects out there to, for you. If they're into stars, any sort of project you can dream of, there's probably a citizen science project around it. So definitely check it out. See if you can find a project that's right for you and your students. And I believe Susan will share in the chat window the link to SciStarter.org, which is a wonderful site for finding citizen science projects. You can search by topic and region and age group and all that good stuff. So when it comes to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology Citizen Science projects, we have five that are currently active and they all follow similar protocols. Just very basically, it's identifying and observing birds, collecting that data, entering it online, and then retrieving and viewing that data as well. Oops. 
So participating in citizen science really makes your observations matter. So when you have a bird feeder out there and you're telling your kids, let's watch birds, you can give them this really powerful real world context for why watching birds matters. One of the citizen science projects I'd like to recommend to you is the Great Backyard Bird Count. This is a four day count period in February and gives us a nice snapshot of winter birds. All it takes is a 15 minute count to participate in this project. Um, and you wanna do your best to kind of count every bird that you can identify, but you can do this pretty much anywhere. You can do it from stationary, watching at a bird feeder. You can do it sitting in your backyard. You can take a walk around your school grounds anything like that and you can participate in the great backyard bird count. Another project that is about to be active is one of our most popular citizen science projects in terms of longevity. This project's been going on for a number of years and once you start it you tend to stick with it. So we've had people doing this for almost as long as the project has existed. And this is Project Feeder Watch. Project Feeder Watch engages thousands of people in science across North America, and it's all about watching at your feeders. And what's kind of fun about Project Feeder Watch is that it has a bit more strict scientific protocols. So it has some more stringent, not stringent isn't the correct world. It has some more strict ways of counting birds. So for example, if you had a chickadee come to the feeder and fly away and come back and fly away, and you're pretty sure it's two chickadees because of like, it flew off in one direction and came back from another, you would still only count that as one because Feeder Watch wants you to count the maximum number of birds that you see at one time. And the reason that they have this more strict counting protocol is because that allows them to handle the data uh, uniformly across all species. So they know that the data was collected and counted in exactly the same way and that allows them to do more powerful analyses. There is a small registration fee associated with Project Feeder Watch. I believe it is $18 for non-members and $15 for members of the lab. And you will get with that fee a poster like the one you see here. There's a Western version too of some of your common feeder birds, as well as the handbook that you can learn all of the protocols and some tips and tricks from. And what's really amazing about the Project Feeder Watch program is that its data has been used multiple times in scientific publications. So Project Feeder Watch is one of the first to detect population declines in the evening gross beak. Um, and you can see a few graphs from the study here. If we look particularly at the North Atlantic region, we can see that there is a pretty steep decline in the percentage of feeders visited, as well as a less steep decline in the average number of birds seen at one time. We can also see that there is kind of a slow but apparent decline in all these different regions. And so this was a published paper. This was real data published in a scientific journal that can then be used to make conservation decisions. So this is data that is really being used. Another program that's turned out a lot of great science is eBird. You'll remember that beautiful image that we looked at earlier. eBird is a really great citizen science project for all around the year. So this one is not a time limited project. Anytime that you are out watching birds, you can submit what you see. Any bird, anytime, anywhere. And what's really wonderful about eBird is that every bird really counts. So a number of years ago now, when eBird was approaching its hundredth millionth observation, everybody at the lab kind of thought, the person submitting that hundredth millionth observation was going to be 
some like really well-known uber birder maybe even somebody from the lab because they submit like three lists a day some some of our uber bird nerds um and we were really astonished and in the education department really happy to see that the hundredth millionth observation was submitted by lee ron who was 12 years old at the time and it was of an american robin so it just really brought home for us that kids matter in citizen science and even the most common birds matter in citizen science. Now, full disclosure, uh, Liron was a pretty amazing birder. These are all his bird photos here that he took. So eBird is a really awesome resource if you want to do citizen science at any time of the year. You can do it counting out a feeder. You can do it out hiking outside. Um, it's pretty adaptable to your needs. And it also has just a truly incredible database for you to draw from. So if you were to hang out on the eBird website and go to the Explore tab, you could start creating graphs with date, some of the data that has been collected. And so here's a graph that I created a while ago looking at northern cardinals and ruby-throated hummingbirds in Missouri. And if we look down here, our x-axis is starting at July 1, going through to the middle being June and July, all the way to December here. So we're looking at a year time span. And then our y-axis is the frequency of reports for this bird. So the idea being that if you were to go outside, you have about here a 50% chance of seeing a northern cardinal during this time of the year. And so what's cool is we can start to make some inferences about these birds by looking at these data. So can you guys draw any conclusions or make any guesses about the biology of these birds based on this graph? So if we look at our frequency over time, are we noticing anything different between these birds and can we make any inferences about them? I'm noticing that our frequency for observing hummingbirds starts out at about zero. Yeah, ex exactly, Laurel and Kim. The hummingbird is migratory. That's why it disappears in Missouri. Uh, January through April and October through December. And then conversely, we can say that our Northern Cardinal is a year round resident. Oh, Jane noticed the dip in June and July. There is a dip for both these birds, isn't there? Yes, and it does have to do with nesting season. So when birds are nesting, they tend to get a little bit more secretive. So in May, they're singing their hearts out, they're declaring their territory, they're finding their mates. And come June and the end of, or beginning of July, these birds are trying to be a little bit secretive, right? They don't wanna lead you directly to their nest. So they're gonna be sneaking around a little bit. So they're a bit harder to detect. And then we start to see them, more of them, uh, going into the later months. And then what's kind of neat looking at the ruby-throated hummingbird is we see that we actually go up higher than our peak in spring. And some of that might be we have young birds, so the this season's immature birds, and we might also have birds from further north migrating through. So there's lots of stuff we can uh, observe just by looking at these data. And what's wonderful about participating in citizen science and feeding birds is that you will find all sorts of curious questions bubbling up in your students. So it's a really wonderful opportunity to encourage some of those questions to become inquiry projects. And if that's something that you think you're interested in, I highly recommend 
our Investigating Evidence curriculum, which is available as a free download. And this will take you through the whole process of using citizen science to inspire inquiry projects. It'll provide you with some timelines about how to go about that. <clears throat> Um, and it works with any citizen science project. So if you are working with iNaturalist or you're working with insects, this curriculum is adaptable for you. So here's one of my very favorite inquiry projects that have been submitted around feeding birds. Some years ago now, Amy was a fourth grader and she noticed that when her neighbor's cat was out, less birds came to her bird feeder. She wanted to see if maybe the reason was that they were scared of the cat. So she decided to do an experiment. She couldn't very well tether her neighbor's cat to the tree. So she decided to put out a fake cat and see if it had the same effect. So here's what Amy observed. She had the feeder out without the cat for, uh, I believe it was two weeks and then no, it was one week, and then a feeder out with the cat for a week, and she measured the amount of seed eaten during those times. And so without the cat, three and a half cups were eaten. With the cat, only half a cup was eaten. So pretty big difference. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So Amy concluded that the cat is a good guard, which I think is a really endearing way to put it. Um, so it's, you know, when we think about this, it might be that it was something novel close to the feeder, or it could be that it was something novel and shaped like a cat. And she wrote this up and submitted it to our Bird Sleuth Investigator magazine. And what I love about this is she took it that next step farther. She did that wonderful thing that science does where it builds up on itself and inspires more questions. So she said she thought the cat was a good guard, but she thought that the birds would realize it was fake over time. So she made a graph predicting what might happen if she left the cat out over a longer period of time and the birds had a chance to get used to it. She predicted that the amount of seed eaten would increase. Another wonderful project is with this combined class of kindergarten and first graders, I believe. Um, and they were looking at the effect of snow depth on the number of birds that they seen. And what's great about this project is that it was using a skill they were learning, measuring, and counting. So they were just counting the number of birds that came. They didn't have to worry about identifying them. Actually, neither in this project or the one with Amy did they have to worry about positively identifying their birds, they were just looking at uh, different markers, so the number or the amount of seed eaten. So even if you aren't able to dive into a bird ID lesson, there are still ways that you can incorporate uh, inquiry into your bird watching. All right, so I want to take a moment to talk about why this is important. So about a year ago, a study came out in Science Magazine that showed that 2.9 billion birds have been lost in Canada and the United States over just 50 years. So that's the total number of birds in this part of North America, 2.9 billion. That's pretty staggering number of birds lost. And what that looks like for feeder birds is about one in four birds gone in just 50 years, so in a human lifetime. So this is a warning to us. This is kind of like a red flag telling us that there's something to be concerned about. And what's important about this study and to me are two things. The first being that one of the ways they determined this was using citizen science data. So it drew from the Christmas bird count which is one of the longest running citizen science projects in this country, I believe. And it's a really well, awesome wealth of data and it drives home the point that these large data sets are the ones that are gonna show us trends. So they're gonna be really important as we move forward in our changing world. 
The second thing that was really important about this study was that it cued us into the fact that some of our common birds are becoming uncommon. And this is important because we were seeing this across many different sorts of birds. So grassland birds and feeder birds and forest birds. So that means there's kind of like a generalized issue. And it's something that now that we know about, we can do something about because we have a lot of reason to hope. We did see increases in very specific groups of birds, raptors, waterfowl, and woodpeckers. And that's because for all three groups of these birds, we have cons had concerted conservation efforts targeted towards them, which means investing money and it means investing time. But when we choose to do that, we make a difference. So that is a very hopeful thing for me. Um, one of our mottos here at the lab is keep common birds common because it's a lot easier to protect a common bird than it is to bring a bird back from the brink of extinction. So this study is a red flag for us that it's time to really dive into this issue and start reversing trends while we can. And the ways that we are gonna know that we're reversing those trends our eBird data, it's Project Feeder Watch data, it is citizen science data that is gonna be the data that we can tease these trends out of. Along with this study, Cornell Lab and amazing groups of partners came together to put out some simple action plans for folks who are interested in helping birds. Um, the seven simple actions include things like doing citizen science. So by encouraging your students to feed birds and be curious and participate in citizen science, you are being part of the larger solution. Another common thing related to, we were talking earlier about window strikes, um, is we can work to make our windows safer. And this is a really great project for kids around schools making window decals can help uh, with that as well. So there are lots of things that we can do to help mitigate some of these harms, like being a citizen scientist. Awesome. So any questions? We have a couple minutes left, so I'm probably going to take us to the eBird website so we can check that out. But I just want to see if there are any questions before we do that. Jane's asking about focused citizen science studies to determine the effects of wildfire devastation. That's a great question, Jane. I'm not really sure. Um, I know that there are probably citizen science databases that could tease out some good data about that. Um, and maybe somebody will come up with one. Oh, I see Susan had a similar answer too. Cool. Yeah, I'm less familiar with wildfires, but I know that um, I'm actually in South Carolina and from hurricanes that there's definitely been some long term studies, not specifically citizen science, but they are studying it. So I would think that was one that happened back in the 80s and citizen science wasn't as um, prevalent. So I would think that they would definitely be using it you know, these days. Um, Kelly, I had um, one person ask about if the feeders are available to homeschool teachers. Typically not, and that has more to do with our ability to ship than anything, but I would think that during the current pandemic setting that we would make an exception um, because we're having to ship to places that we don't usually ship to anyway. Um, so I would say that in this instance, yeah, we can. Laurel's asking about limited to ordering one feeder. We ask that you keep it to um, four feeders per school. So if you have some other teachers like in your grade band that want to do it too, we can ship four to a school. And Kelly, there was also a question about 
from Asher asking about a website for feeding birds in your hand. Hmm. I'm not aware of a website for that. I do know that we had one student do a project, a research project about feeding birds from the hand. Um, and the approach that she took was putting out a dummy in particular clothes and having it sit in a chair and putting seed in its glove. And then one day she just put herself in the clothes and the glove and was able to get the birds to eat from her hand. So um, that's something you want to be a little bit careful about just because we want to not necessarily encourage birds to interact with people because sometimes they interact with somebody who doesn't know how to handle them and gets afraid and it can scare the bird and the person. So we got to find a balance there. Cool. So we've got just a couple minutes left. So I'm going to switch my screen share here. I think I need to stop the screen just because of how I shared it. And let's see if we can't do a little exploration. Let's go to eBird. So I wanted to show you real quick the eBird website and where you can go to explore data and get graphs like the ones we were sharing at. So you go to the explore tab on the eBird website and then you go to the bar charts page. From here, you wanna select your region. So I'm just gonna do New York because that's where I currently am. And I'll do counties in New York and then I'll hit continue. I'm gonna choose my county, which is Tompkins. And now I can see all the way from back from our earliest data in 1900 to our uh, most recent data in 2020. And you can see these green bar graphs for the birds that are around you. So if we look, let's scroll down to some feeder birds. It might take a little while to get there. Here we go. We've got some nuthatches and wrens, starlings. You can see by the height of the green bar how common they are during that time of year. So we can see that the great catbird is very uncommon, virtually disappears in the winter months, very common in the summer months. We see a similar pattern in the house wren with them disappearing in the winter months. So we can again make an inference about um, whether or not these birds are migratory. So we're having a bit of an eruption year with red-breasted nuthatches, so let's check them out. And to do that, I'm gonna hit this line graph button. And this is gonna give me that data over that long period of time. But let's say I want more like, I wanna see more recent data. So I'm gonna go from the last 20 years, I think, 2000 to 2020. And now we can see that red-breasted nuthatch. Now, if I wanted to add in some other species, I would go here to change species and I could add in something like, a, huh, let's do a rose-breasted grosbeak. Let's do a red-winged blackbird and a northern cardinal. You can do up to five species. And then when I hit continue, it's going to bring up their different graphs. So you can compare these birds. So we see that the rose-breasted grosbeak here in gold is a migratory species. So is the red-winged blackbird, but it's around for a lot longer and it reaches a much higher peak of frequency being reported. Whereas our northern cardinal is a pretty steady resident as well as the red-breasted nuthatch, but at much lower levels. 
So you can kind of get a feel for some of these different birds just by looking at these graphs. There's a lot of fun that you can have by playing around on the eBird website. I also recommend checking out the science tab, which has some just really amazing images and graphics showing migration. So for example, here is the wood thrush. And these models are created using citizen science data and um, land cover data from NASA, as well as population densities, things like that. Pretty cool. All right. Well, we are just about out of time. So I do want to share um, some options that you have for getting credit for these webinars. We do have a CEU option, but it would it involves watching five webinars and writing up an implementation plan, or watching one webinar, writing up an implementation plan, and writing a report on how the implementation goes. You can find that on our website. And we also do simple letters of completion. So I will email you a PDF letter saying that you attended this webinar for one contact hour if you attended it live. Um, so please feel free to email us at k12lab at cornell.edu if you are interested in a completion letter. And with that, I'll throw it back to you if you have any questions. But I want to say thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you are excited about feeding birds and are considering doing it with your students. Kathy's asking about the new kits through NASCO. Unfortunately, Kathy, that has been delayed even further due to the pandemic. So we're now hoping for a spring release. I know, I apologize. We're feeling a little frustrated as well. Just, you know, but there's not really anything that anybody can do about it, unfortunately. All right. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm going to mute myself for a moment, but we will be hanging out for just a little bit longer in case you have more questions. Ashra, I see that you had a question. Did you, you wanted to unmute for a second? Do it. So when I grow up, I want to work in the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Oh, that's wonderful. You're a big fan of birds? Very. Do you have a favorite bird? I like all. <laughs> it's really hard to pick, isn't it? <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I hope that you get the chance to come see us at the lab sometime. When it's open again, you should come out and see it. Yes. Always nice to hear from a future ornithologist.
All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you in a future webinar. I hope you have a great rest of your week. Um, take care. <laughs>